Having shown that the periodical resistance on the part of working men against a reduction of wages and their periodical attempts at getting a rise of wages are inseparable from the wage system and dictated by the very fact of labor being assimilated into commodities and therefore subject to the laws regulating the general movement of prices, having furthermore shown that a general rise of wages would result in a fall in the rate of profit, but not affect the average prices of commodities or their values. The question now ultimately arises, how far in this incessant struggle between capital and labor the latter is likely to prove successful? <clears throat> I might answer by a generalization and say that as with all other commodities, so with labor. Its market price will, in the long run, adapt itself to its value. That therefore, despite all the ups and downs, and do what he may, the working man will on average only receive the value of his labor, which resolves into the value of his laboring power, which is determined by the value of the necessaries required for its maintenance and reproduction, which value of necessaries finally is regulated by the quantity of labor required to produce them. But there are some peculiar features which distinguish the value of laboring power or the value of labor <coughs> from the values of all other commodities the value of laboring power is formed by two elements. The one merely physical, the other historical or social. Its ultimate limit is determined by the physical element, that is to say, to maintain and reproduce itself, to perpetuate its physical existence. The working class must receive the necessaries absolutely indispensable for living and multiplying. The value of those indispensable necessaries forms therefore the ultimate limit of the value of labor power. On the other hand, the length of the working day is also limited by ultimate, although very elastic, boundaries. Its ultimate limit is given by the physical force for the, of the laboring man. If the daily exhaustion of, the, of his vital forces exceeds a certain degree, it cannot be exerted anew day by day. However, as I said, this limit is very uh, elastic a quick succession of unhealthy and short-lived generations will keep the labor market as well supplied as a series of vigorous, long-lived generations. Besides this mere physical element, the value of labor is in every country determined by a traditional standard of life. It is not mere physical life but it is the satisfaction of certain wants springing from the social conditions in which people are placed and reared up. The English standard of life may be reduced to the Irish standard, the standard of life of the German peasant to that of the Livonian peasant. The important part which historical tradition and social habitude play in this respect you may learn from Mr. Thornton's work on overpopulation, where he shows that the average wages in different agricultural districts in England still nowadays differ more or less according to the more or less favorable circumstances under which the districts have emerged from the state of serfdom. This historical or social limit entering into the value of labor may be expanded or contracted or altogether extinguished 
so that nothing remains but the physical limit. During the time of the anti-Jacobin war, undertaken as the incorrigible tax eater and sinecurist old George Rose used to say, to save the comforts of our holy religion from the infroads of the French infidels, the honest English farmers, so tenderly handled in a former chapter of ours, depressed the wages of the agricultural labors even below that mere physical minimum, but made up by the poor laws the remainder necessary for the physical perpetuation of the race. This was a glorious way to convert the wages laborer into a slave, and, the, and Shakespeare's proud yeoman into a pauper. By comparing the standard wages or values of labor, labor in different countries, and by comparing them in different historical epics of the same country, you will find that the value of labor itself is not a fixed, but a variable magnitude, even supposing the values of all other commodities to remain constant. A similar comparison would prove that not only the market rates of profit change, but its average rates. But as to profits, there exists no law which determines their minimum. We cannot say what is the ultimate limit of their decrease. And why cannot we fix that limit? Because although we can fix the minimum of wages, we cannot fix their maximum. <clears throat> we can only say that the limits of the working day being given the maximum profit corresponds to the physical minimum of wages and that wages being given the maximum of profit corresponds to such a prolongation of the working day as is compatible with the physical forces of the laborer. The maximum of profit is therefore limited by the physical minimum of wages and the physical maximum of the working day. It is evident that between the two limits of the maximum rate of profit, an immense scale of variations is possible. The fixation of its actual degree is only settled by the continuous struggle between capital and labor. The capitalists constantly tending to reduce wages to their physical minimum and to extend the working day to its physical maximum, while the working man constantly presses in the opposite direction. The matter resolves itself into a question of the respective powers of the com combatants.